Welcome to Real Herbalism Radio, recorded at River Road Studios in Eugene, Oregon. Today's show is brought to you by the ever-popular, always famous Herbal Nerd Society. The Herbal Nerd Society. Yeah. yeah. It's so great to have something that can support the work that we do. And, you know, I, I love getting feedback from people that are in that. And I love being able to share more information. And we, Herbal's world is just changing so fast, too. It seems like it's a race to try to keep up. It sure is. Yeah. It sure is. Happily, the Herbal Nerd Society is so cool. They don't need to worry about keeping up. Mm, no, we help them with that. <laughs> so, yeah, thank you very so much you. for supporting our podcasts and the books that we write and the the website that we have. And um, Herbal Nerd Society is how that happens. Yes. Yes. Yep. So thank you. Thank you very much. And remember, if you want to join the Herbal Nurse Society, it's easy to do. The com, and go to the top tab. It says join the Herbal Nurse Society. There's- so if you're looking to you know, support uh, herbalism and herbs and getting information out to everybody, including yourself, mm-hmm. then joining the Herbal Nurse Society is a really great way to do that. We, we appreciate your support. And please remember, we really benefit from the reviews that you write, um, not only for the books, but also for um, our podcast that helps people so that they can learn more about herbs. It's so important. I personally think for people to have a diversity of healing tactics and modalities to access, it makes the world a better place. Indeed. All right. On with the show. Today, we're talking with Nicole Telkish, practicing clinical herbalist and director of the Wildflower School of Botanical Medicine about harvesting herbs for winter herbal remedies. Now, here are your hosts, Candace Hunter, and Sue Sierra Lupe. I'm Candace Hunter. And I'm Sue Sierra Lupe. And, and welcome, welcome to, to Real Herbalism, Herbalism Radio. Welcome back, Nicole. We are so happy to have you with us today. Yeah. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. Fourth time's a charm. Right? <laughs> yeah. This is the fourth time we've had the opportunity to interview you. And you're a... Uh, you you are a woman that knows all about different types of climates because you've been rolling around this fine earth of ours in the southwest <laughs> and the northwest and every other place in between. What here it is summer. What are we supposed to do about herbalism now? Well, it really depends on where you live, right? Because mm-hmm. it, it, it's going to determ- be determined by what your needs are where you live. And I'm going to think about this in terms of the most a general thing, which would be a temperate zone, right? A lot of people live in a temperate zone, but there's quite a few people that are listening to this that may not be living in a temperate zone as well. But in a temperate zone, you're going to be wanting to think about cooler, moister times. And I'm looking at, you know, older forms of holistic medicine when I say that, because winter is considered in Greek medicine a a cooler or moister time. And so we look for herbs that are warm and dry for this phlegmatic type condition. What's a phlegmatic type condition? A, a, a moist and cool condition. So if you think of, about phlegm and moistness and coolness, when you're, when you're sitting stagnant and it's cold, certain types of conditions arise around this. So in holistic herbal medicine, you would want to use things that warm and dry the system and get circulation going and move those things out. So a lot of times people will get respiratory infections that sit and are phlegmatic. And there they would also have um, maybe their digestions off, depression beca- uh, can set in, all sorts of little conditions and symptoms can arise that could be associated with the cooler, moister weather, um, not just their time of life and other things that that we would look at. But it, it, so winter, I think of what herbs in summer would I want to have and and be gathering right now in a temperate zone to help ward off this these kinds of conditions. Can you, can you think of other conditions that would come up in winter that are cool and moist too? I always like to because this is a kind of yeah. no you know. These are, this is a concept that you would have to know more about the theory, but it's very, uh, it's very basic too. Yeah. In, in Minnesota, where I grew up, it's very cold, 
moisture is more marginal because once you get down into the cold enough temperatures, the cold is sucking the moisture out of the air in the form of of snow and ice. Mm -hmm. um, but the conditions even there are not that different from the conditions in the Pacific Northwest where I'm living now, where it gets where it just stays moist all winter. And one of the big things that shows up that there and here would be like the cold flu, pneumonias and bronchitis. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. those are those respiratories that, and they don't, it's hard to get rid of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's also, it's because our circulation is slowed down. We're not mm -hmm. usually moving as much and that's actually normal and natural for humans. And when it's colder and darker, uh, it's, it's something that we've always done. And if you are from a temperate zone is that you slow down, you hibernate almost, and you kind of nest and do less and you're supposed to. So it's almost, you know, a lot of people do new year's resolutions, but um, it's not really the time to be starting a bunch of new habits. It's actually a really good time to slow down and, and really take care of yourself. So some of the herbs that I would think about in the summer when they're, everything's out and beautiful and bright and we have flowers everywhere and fruit starting or already coming in. And um, I would think about what to harvest to bring the light in mm -hmm. to the darker, cooler times and the warmth. So, um, so some of the things that I found, like in the Pacific Northwest, for example, I, I have one herb that I've decided is going to be the herb of specifically Portland, because I spend a lot of time there, but they're lemon balm. Okay. Yes. Can we just say I, this I, is a weed? Oh yeah. Lemon. It's a total it's, weed. Mm -hmm. it's, it's definitely such a weed. A weed. <laughs> Everybody should be getting to know lemon balm and using it. It's yes. in their yards. It's, it's coming into the green belts, into the wild spaces, and it's invasive. Mm -hmm. It's, yes taking over places. These are the things I love to connect to because to me, it's trying to say something to you. Yes. <laughs> yes. So lemon balm is one of the most joyful, bright herbs I can think of. Yeah. And I will say disclaimer, there are a bunch of contraindications that if you're on certain medications mm -hmm. or have a certain Thyroid. health, yeah, yeah, you're going to, you're going to want to know more about it, but in general, if you are an average person with little to no health conditions that you're having to work with, this is a pretty, what we would call a generally recognized as safe herb, mm -hmm. right? Yes. This, is, yes. this is a common European invasive plant, and it grows like a weed all over the Pacific Northwest. Yep. I can and so those are the ones I try to think about, because if, if I'm going to even grow it in my garden, I want it to be easy. To grow and, right. and and when I when I harvest it, I want it to be something I can get regularly because you know a lot of people want to wildcraft these these native medicinal plants and there's a lot of controversy around that. And one of the things I'm gonna say about that is you know if you can maybe find a native plant, eat, let's just take all the other cultural appropriation and other things aside. But it, as far as you know. Well, whether or not we should be harvesting native herbs. Um, but besides all that, it's hard to find native medicinals. You have to understand how to identify plants properly. You have to know where to go. You have to be ready to get dirty. All these things that a lot of people these days are not ready to do. Right. So if you have a weed that's all over the place that has a ton of great things that you can use it for that are that's easy to get to use it get to know it well you should know everything about it this is something that you can use a million different ways how did what's your favorite way of using lemon balm me too yeah oh, okay Sue. cool yeah i use lemon balm at the clinic all the time it's our the first thing we think of when someone comes in with an anxious condition and the other thing that we see often is people that have something in the, the herpes family or shingles, um, not as much chicken pox, although it works against that, um, both oral and genital herpes and mono, they're all in the same family, virus family. And boy, I tell you what, lemon balm, that's our, that's our first hit for both of those things. But anxiety um, for people who just are bluesy 
and then for those the herpes family. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it is antiviral and really, I mean, it tastes good too, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. it'll settle your stomach. Yes, you know, which is one of the ways that it helps people with anxiety as well. Yep, tastes mm -hmm. like lemon. yeah, a lot of mint family. Um, and do you use it any other way, Candice? Or one of the things that I've done, I've done a lot of the like what. Sue's talked about, but one of the things that I did, um, because she kept pointing out how it's for the herpes family and the cold sores are in the herpes family. I thought, you know, I wonder if this will work. And it actually seems to work pretty well. I turned it into a oil. So I did a, um, did an oil infusion and then turned it into a lip balm. And when yeah. you get that stress, you can usually, when a cold sore is getting ready to break out, you can kind of feel just before it starts to break out you feel it coming and the lemon balm actually stops it in its tracks. So mm -hmm. I've been pretty impressed with just, you know, a lemon, a lip balm. Cause yeah. it's, it's not going to, I know it's not as probably not as potent as like a tincture, but yeah, I, I'm kind of thinking about this whole, um, the way I was raised to think about raised the way I was trying to think about lemon balm. Um, I need to rethink it because that the in wrote, uh, there was a, a research that came out that even just lemon balm tea helped mm -hmm. take the uh, radiation stores and um, yeah. x-ray techs, um, thyroid glands down. And I thought, wow, that's dry yeah. tea. I was told that's, that's poo-poo. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's know, not. <laughs> well, the problem with lemon balm is that it's the essential oil, especially is really fragile. And so I think it's really the quality of the tea. And, mm -hmm. you know, if, yeah. if you get a really high quality tea that's fresh and fr dried properly mm -hmm. and you can use it, I think a lot of the, that we have to consider that, you know, when it, there's research like that, what teas were they researching? Something from some big corporate, you know, industrial, you know, company that was on Amazon getting hundreds <laughs> of pounds who knows where are you asking or, like the older studies that i was referring to or this newer yeah. study or just teas in general yeah. like what, uh -huh. what, what were they what were they looking at as right far as, well apparently uh, in the study that i was referring to they were looking at some fine fine and dandy tea because it worked fabulously <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, good well and and uh lemon balm i what i really like about it we do provings with it where, where we'll you know, pass around in class. We won't talk about what it is and we'll see what happens to people. And this is the one yeah. that if there was any herb that was going to cause the whole class to have a giggle yeah. breakdown, everybody just started laughing and couldn't stop. This is the one because yeah. it's so, I mean, it's a euphoric when it to is. me, as soon as I see it, people start taking it. They just start to drift up into the ethers and start smiling and before you know it they're like what were we talking about uh, yeah. yeah yeah we've <laughs> we've used it in our family to combat homesickness um shortly after moving out to the pacific northwest we were dealing with some homesickness because it's a very different climate it's the same mm -hmm. latitude as where we came from in minnesota but the climate is really different and just simple things like there's no blue jays out here it's, it's weird so that mm -hmm. first winter we used lemon balm and it really did lift the spirits. Mm. Right. And it's warm and dry. Remember yeah. I was talking about those energetics, like that's a, a most mint family plants. A lot of them would be considered warmer and drier. And so they, they kind of take that cool moistness of winter and start to dry it out and warm it up and mints especially get, you know, secretions going. So it's also diaphoretic and yeah. can help during colds and flu that way, which means helps you to sweat. Yes. Which is kind of nice in the middle of winter, actually. Mm. <laughs> yeah. It warming up circulation any, any which way. Um, one of the things I did, you know, when I think about, I, we could talk for an hour about lemon balm, so I won't, I won't belabor the point, but I'd say one of my favorite ways to, to take it is, as a cordial, I like to make a cordial out of it. I did this where I infused honey with lemon balm and uh, and a, a little bit of whiskey, and uh -huh. I did a whiskey honey lemon balm cordial with fresh lemon balm from the garden, and then took it out in the winter when people were meh, yeah. and it just brought everyone's. Well, first of all, you say cordial, everyone goes yes. 
Yeah, exactly. Ooh. You know, sweet alcohol <laughs> extract, which you usually can't go wrong with unless you have an alcohol uh, reason you can't drink alcohol. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> so right. otherwise, it's one of herbalists' favorite concoctions is to do things with cordials. And yes, things. definitely. So, what other herbs do you like for harvesting in the summer? Well, I really like. Uh, you know, I'm thinking about these warming, drying herbs. And one of the things that comes in too is Tulsi. Mm. Tulsi. Oh, you just, I mean, just to think about Tulsi just makes me dreamy a little yeah. bit. Yeah. That's one, that's one of my favorites. A few drops of that every day through December. Oh, okay. Uh, extract. Yeah. Huh. yeah. All right. Holy basil is another name for that for folks. That yeah. Are wondering. Holy basil. Mm-hmm. And the, and you know, I, I've seen it, you know, it, it, it's kind of, I feel like sometimes plants, they want us to start using them more and more. And maybe that's a selfish, you know, belief of mine, but I've found that Tulsi seems to be spreading more and more easily in people's gardens over the years. Like it seems to really just, I actually in the South, in the garden I have down in Texas, I've had two crops of it um, throughout the year. I get the first crop that finishes in May, and then we get a second crop in September, October. Wow, that's so, nice. So we have two crops of it, and we do, again, cordials and uh, with it, but also teas. Lemon, nice. uh, to me, Tulsi tea is such a delicious tea, and you can add in other things, but it becomes like the centerpiece or uh something that really brings this added dimension to uh, other herbs because it, it's this brightness that yeah. again like lemon balm warm dry bright and something that really lifts the spirits mm-hmm. yeah so what kind of things do you like to blend with tulsi then oh gosh i you know with tulsi i have this favorite blend i do but again it's a southern one from like a, a hot garden in the south <laughs> my my hot blend tea that comes from my garden is uh we do we grow hibiscus and we put hand harvested hibiscus tulsi uh passion flower from the garden and then because that also comes up in the heat and then uh, we have mexican marigold and that brings this delicious anise flavor to our blend um so you get this really i like to have as many flavors in there as possible so you get sweet sour aromatic all these different things going on in your mouth and it's just fun Mm. that sounds absolutely (laughs) delicious yeah and hibiscus is so cooling that will be great Mm -hmm. it puts you right to sleep tell you what that's that's a hammock tea right there lovely um and and then i think about you know plants of the sun because another thing you know when we're talking about the winter in temperate zones it's 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 darker it's colder and so plants of the sun, you know, if you look at it in medical astrology, these are plants that have uh, either they're evergreen, and that's where the idea of, of Christmas trees originally came from, was that it was a plant that represented the sun god, and uh, it was cut and, and put out in sacrifice. And, uh, and anyway, so these, these evergreens are, are also medicinal and warming and drying. Like- so I like pines and things like that yeah like aromatic evergreens that that you can use these aromatics these smells these volatile oils to warm and dry the system so i like to make oils out of the whatever the native or weedy species are that you can get wind blown on the ground in your backyard and mm-hmm. make these nice warming oils that um, you can put on your body later so you can make these oils in the summer and then stash them for the winter and part of you know the winter you get the dry skin sometimes and Mm -hmm. um, you just want to moisturize and you want to be warm and so oil is a warm substance and then you have this nice aromatic in there that can also help with circulation because aromatic herbs tend to be rubefacient and circulatory so even rose I was hoping you were going to hit some of those because that's one of the other things that show sh- has shown up in Minnesota as well as here in the Pacific Northwest that I've you know experienced or have known people experience, which is the dry, achy bones. That you know that it's not really arthritis, but everything aches more in the winter. Hmm. Hmm. 
Yeah, and I think again, to me, it's all about circulation. So I I like to have baths um, and oils that I've created from these warm, dry plants, which include it could be it, as simple as rosemary. And I always tell folks start with those simple weeds that are or people things that people landscape with that they're never using. Don't try to go for the native stuff that you may or may not identify properly. You want to do things like rosemary that everybody across country pretty much has in their gardens and just sits there looking pretty and never gets used. But rosemary is definitely a plant of the sun. And it's very much, um, it's not just good in oil. You can do it as a tea to help with circulation. And it really helps to get the blood moving and blood pumping and get those achy joints taken care of and flushed with fresh warmth. Um, around the joints and such. So I think rosemary is really where I would go for a, a plant of the sun and evergreen like that. Nice. Another mint. Mints. <laughs> yeah, ever mint. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Do you use rosemary at all? Or? Uh, well, we have, um, we have one that we combine with St. John's wort in a sap to kind of bring um, warmth and healing to people that have um, injured muscles muscles and tendons and that nice. works pretty good um and there's uh several people that like uh, it's part of their their migraine formula mm, yeah uh, absolutely i can see that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that works great uh and then the rosemary oil it seems like um people uh, that have had frostbite or they have neuropathy in their hands and feet rubbing that in with, you know, some of the other things like lavender or something like that. It, that's a not nice way to kind of bring, bring circulation back to the, to that area. Yeah. And not to forget that, that a nice hot bath with some of these herbs can be delightful. Mm -hmm. in, mm -hmm. times too, so. Or yeah. if you're, uh, if you're unfortunate like me and you don't have a proper bathtub, a good foot soak. A foot soak. It's actually yes. amazing how much a foot soak with nice hot water does actually warm the whole body. Yeah. I think Definitely. one of the other nice things about rosemary is that it's familiar. So yeah. uh, people aren't going, well, I, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what to do with this herb. It's kind of weird. They, they know rosemary, they know the smell, it's comforting and it's, and it's old fashioned. So it doesn't freak them out. Mm -hmm. And it does so much even as a tea, because, you know, when people want something that's stimulating that isn't coffee, I oftentimes have them do rosemary tea because it really does. If you've ever don't drink it at night necessarily, because it really <laughs> will keep you going. It, it's something that definitely stimulates the body. So it, to me, it's a great alternative to caffeine if you want to get a little buzzy. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, um, and and besides that, I think that, you know, we could, the one, the elephant in the room I haven't mentioned is the St. John's Ward. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I was wondering if you would bring that one up because it is, I mean, it's got a lot of like interactions that you have to, you know, watch out for if you're taking it internally. But at least in the Pacific Northwest, it's a weed on par with lemon balm, if not worse. Mm -hmm. Right. And I don't really use it a lot at, because of how how much, um, first of all, I lived in the South for a really long time where it did not grow. Right. And so I just didn't use it internally. I did always use it externally. And so I have a lot of experience with that, but I've kind of strayed away from it even internally as I've been around it more because it's just not called to me to be in my repertoire. But externally, I find it to be really great for neural healing as well as um as well as having uh circulatory help with circulation but it, it's something that i'm a little a little sketchy about just because it does have some contraindications with it and interactions and so as far as topically too we have to watch out because it has the the photosensitization that um, I've actually seen happen with people where they get burned more easily mm -hmm. when they take it internally or use it externally. So, um, but it is something that's a weed around the Pacific Northwest and many parts of the country north. Yeah. Um, so it's something to consider. Well, we we need it around here or herbs like that um, 
unless you're on an SSRI, of course, which a lot of people are these days, but the being more photosensitive um, during the winter helps with uh, the vitamin D absorption. Yeah. Absolutely. yeah, absolutely. I can see that. Yeah. And I, I might, I'm looking forward to creating, having a different relationship to it since I, I, I do have it as a weed around me right now and I've mm-hmm. been working with it more, but you know, I, I did want to mention, do you, do you have any others that you feel like you use in the summer that I'm not getting to? Because I, I'm just curious if there's others that you find to be your you're, or in, that you're going to gather in the summer that you're going to be going to in the winter for sure. Now for me, Douglas fir is one that ends up showing up because there's usually at least one windstorm that pops up. A lot of times it's a little bit later. It might be more like, you know, August, September. So we might still have a little bit of time before it shows up, but you get one or two of those and that drops enough branches for me to make a good oil. And I use that. I mean, I'll use it internally in the winter as well. Like we'll, you know, baste things and use it in salad dressings. And um, last year when I was, it was in the fall, I think it was going into the fall. I started cooking a lot of mushrooms, sauteing them with Douglas fir oil. And I was noticing that that was like, it was just really calling to me to do that. And it was a really rough cold and flu season. There was an upper respiratory um, virus that was going through my family and through our community. It was really tough for people to kick it. And it was one of those viruses where the only real way to kick it is to get a sunny attitude, get really positive and just hunker down, give yourself the rest you need and, and get through it. And Douglas fir oil really, for me, Douglas fir is like one of those, it's an uplifting plant. Yeah. That's true. It's delicious too. Yep. Yeah, it is. <laughs> well, there's a lot of berries yeah. too. You know, raspberry, raspberry leaf, um, mm-hmm. blueberries, blueberry leaf. Those are all fabulous things to collect for. And know. make cordials out of. Yeah, mm-hmm. make cordials out of. Or, <laughs> yes. You know. Yes. So I love adding things like that. I mean, the, the fruits, uh, you know, when you save your summer fruits, you know, to me, food is medicine too, yeah. right? So, so if you have any food uh, that's growing in your backyard or that you're stewarding land with and, and gathering, you know, wild berries or something, mm-hmm. uh, then I think that being able to open up uh, some sort of beautiful fruit concoction that you created in the summer when it's, you know, dead and barren out is a, a really fabulous way to celebrate the sun also. Yes. Yeah. Well, and apple season's coming up and that, I mean, applesauce. Of right. course, oh, yeah. right? When you have an upset stomach or you got you got the poops. Yeah. Yeah. Or or you're constipated either way. Um mm-hmm. spilanthes is a plant that I really love harvesting in the summer and combining that with strawberry leaf um, yeah. for a great dental. Mm-hmm. Um or we have a dental rinse we pass out a lot and that works I'm all, fabulously. That <laughs> yeah. How do you do that? Is that an alcohol based dental rinse? Yeah. Then, or? Yeah. Um we, we, because they're spitting it out, okay. we don't have problems with the people that have alcohol sensitivities. Nice. So is it, in essence, it's like making a, a tincture blend that they'll, yeah. is it diluted at all or they'll, is it straight up tincture blend? The folks that come in, they'll just take um, like 0.8 mil, squirt it into, which is about a, a draw from a So like a dropper, dropper full, full of foam. Yeah, approximately. So. And then they squirt that into a little tiny bit of water. Um, I usually oh, tell nice. them because of the unhoused that I deal with, they'll have so, these like water a table containers or something. Yeah. yeah. So they can just put that in the cap of their water container nice. and then put the squirt in there and then rinse it around, let it sit there for a while until the spilanthi starts to numb things and then they can spit it out or they can swallow it. Depends. Yeah. But what makes sense? Yeah. That's spilanthi cool. is adorable too because it looks like mm-hmm. a, a little eye, a little red eye. <laughs> I love harvesting that. Yeah. It feels great on all mucous membranes too, mm-hmm. just a little FYI. Yeah, definitely. And it's a fabulous thing to put in um, any kind of balm that you're making if you've got just muscles that hurt right away because spilanthes numbs things. So I think that... Yeah, so it works a little bit like clothes. Exactly. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. But it's uh, like I put... I hadn't uh, thought about using it topically that way. That's oh. exciting, actually. Mm-hmm. This year, I'm just beginning to work with spilanthes. I've got some seeds, 
oh, starting to grow, cool. but they're long. Yeah, if I remember right, though, I have a packet and I need to actually grow them. Right. Sure. So, you know. <laughs> yeah. I, I think we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about calendula. Yes, oh, we would be. Yes. Yes. Calendula. Calendula, a plant of the sun again. Mm-hmm. And it's it's definitely, you know, it's funny in the deep south, that's a winter crop. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> yeah, I actually yeah. would grow it from like November through March. Oh, that's and funny. At harvesting it before it got too hot and died completely. But in, in the in Pacific Northwest, it looks like it just kind of grows all year round. It does. Pretty. It does. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, it's definitely you can see the the sun when you look at it, and uh, it, it's something to me. What what's not in a lot of herb books that I don't know if you've had this experience, but I've found this to be true is that I sprinkle in just a little bit of the flowers into things in the winter, Mm -hmm. whether it's tea or if I have some fresh stuff in the garden, I can get to just a few petals and it seems to brighten the mood. I've actually used it as a mood elevator. Interesting. Um, It's not, I haven't seen any literature necessarily on that but I've just been finding that when I've made teas with it people really felt more clear and that could also be because it's a bitter and alterative um, but I don't ever add that much it's just touch it's so bitter yeah. Well, I mean, as a bitter, even though it's not strongly bitter, it's also asking your liver to start moving and clear itself right. a little bit. Mm-hmm. And that right. that instantly, I mean, when you get your liver moving, anger and all that anger and depression tend to lift. So mm-hmm. bitters are really wonderful for that. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. I think that's a big part of winter health, um, thinking about winter health in the summer is, you know, as we're sitting here sweating, right. then, <laughs> then it's hard to imagine sitting there in the winter, um, wanting something to warm you up, but it's, it's definitely, uh, you know, or, or move stuff out. But I, I find that people will have digestive issues in the winter too. So I like to make sure that there's bitters like, and I, I have a gut healing tea that I use uh, calendula in as well as some alternative nice. blends that I've used calendula and to help just movement because it's all about movement when there's the lack of movement that's when all these kinds of conditions set in and that's why it's so important to us as far as alternatives go i think that we as herbalists want to make sure people are pooping peeing and sweating well even through the winter yes actually that's really important at least i can speak to the northern climates it's really important to keep moving Yes. Really important. And, you know, I did want to just say a few of the herbs that I I think the way we want to, for those of people that might be listening to this from Southern climates that are sitting here going, what are you guys talking about? (laughs) (laughs) Right. (laughs) What we experience, but I can say from living in a place that doesn't really have the same types of seasons or, you know, here I am, uh, I've been in, in Tucson recently and, Tucson, you know, as far as what are you harvesting in summer for winter, there is nothing to harvest in summer because summer, it's, everything's already dried out and it's it going barren because it's it's trying to get through to the monsoon season. And yeah. um, as far as harvesting goes, that's a completely different rhythm that the Southwest is living in or the deep South. So, you know, just living in, in Texas, I can think about it, when I was there in the summer, I was harvesting a lot of these warm, dry plants again. But uh, the idea that, you know, bee balm was all, spotting everything all mm-hmm. over the fields, you'd see a bunch of bee balm and I would harvest bee balm and make it into honey. And bee balm is a Monarda species and we would make it into honey. And then you could use that honey for coughs and, and throat problems, uh, throat infections and, and lung infections later in the season because it, it's such a great aromatic herb again a lot of the ones we've talked about from fur doug fur that's been blown down in some sort of windstorm to rosemary to bee balm or um, tulsi or lemon but all these aromatics they they tend to work through irritation a little bit and pushing things through and so if you infuse honeys with them this is a really great thing for winter for um you know any kind of irritation and 
throat, especially. So bee balm is my favorite in honey. And then I also think about in the South that prickly pears are making their fruits in the late summer, early fall. And that's something that I'll make into syrups for later on in, in the year, again, harvesting those fruits. Um, and then in the deep South, I also think about uh, ragweed. Ragweed yeah. is a really, really common native plant that's ex extremely invasive in many parts of the South. And it's something that people are eradicating left and right. Yet I've actually traded St. John's wort for ragweed in clinics north to south because the northern clinics really wanted to use my ragweed in their uh, allergy formulas. So I've been trade. They would send me the St. John's wort. I would send them the ragweed because they mm -hmm. were really yeah, so, so ambrosia or ragweed to me is another thing in the summer I think a lot about in more southern climate, climates. Do the but, southern uh, climates, when it gets that hot, I mean, in the northern climates, you start to see everything die back in the fall, so yeah. that's when you go dig your roots. What about in the southern climates, when it's getting that hot and everything's just sort of trying to get through to monsoon, Does that is that the time where all the energy's in the roots so you would dig your roots or? no. Actually, the, the plants are struggling to get through. And so you actually want to leave those roots alone. Okay. And, and I don't really, because the thing is, is that, you know, you would want to prune everything back, definitely, so that it doesn't put as much energy into having to be beat back by the sun and it has less, you know, green stuff to have to worry about. But everything's going to wilt back and you basically give it a really nice bed of mulch and you leave it alone and let it get through the summer and then in the fall is when you start using it again. And in the fall is when you would plant a lot of perennials and you would still, we deal with roots in the fall, but it's, the energy isn't the same. It's right. not the same rhythm. It's not the same intensity. And I didn't, in the South, I never really uh, gathered a lot of roots because I didn't think it was necessary. And I would, I did, I did wait till things went barren up top and that's a very small window. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because, yeah, exactly. I mean, the South is so much more, it offers so much more ability to grow through the cooler months. You know, if the, there's <laughs> yeah, yeah. In the North, I, I mean, in the North, it, it it's kind of obvious when it's time just to go out and pick your horseradish, for instance, right. you know, but the South, right. I'm like, oh, I don't know how that would work. So we, we would, we grow through you know, many, many climates, not the Southwest necessarily, but the deep South, can, you know, would grow through, you could have three crops a year sometimes of different things. And you just can't, the only time you can't plant would be in the middle of summer. Uh -huh. And so then you would plant in the fall, you would plant in the winter, you plant in the spring, different things, but you just have to leave summers when everything's kind of left alone right. as much as possible. And you just prune it back and wait and try to get your plants through it. <laughs> especially with global warming i mean with yeah. climate change it's it's really wreaking habit on on those of us that garden and and it's it's a different world every year you never know what to expect yeah i think it's calling all of us to pay far far more attention not to the weather reporters on tv or internet but to the actual weather to what mother earth is doing and saying what are the animals doing and saying if you really pay attention to them they know, they recognize usually what's coming before it arrives. If we start paying attention again, we start to recognize it, mm -hmm. you know, which in turn also helps us as a human species to start paying more attention in general and, and making better choices about how we use our resources to better, you know, support Mother Earth anyway. Right. It's about not just taking, but giving back. And I, I like that, Sue, I've heard you say things like forming relationships. And I think that's just mm -hmm. such an important thing is that the, the stronger our relationships with the earth and these plants, the more we can kind of help with the adaptations, look and see what's changing and how we need to change to help to adjust the with the plants to what's happening. Because I, you know, I, I can move around and I have this, this really great ability as a human. And I'm so privileged to be able to go into the AC if it gets too hot. Right. Or <laughs> I, you know, I look outside and I, I live on a botanical sanctuary part of the year. And it's those poor critters and the plants, they're having to really struggle through extreme 
challenges with the, you know, temperatures and flooding and all these different things. And it's, it's hard to watch sometimes when you see the struggles that are going on as a human. And, you know, we're, we're, so, we're all struggling, but, you know, some, some plants and, and critters don't have any choices about movement or where they're at. Yeah. Well, we definitely, I think as a species need to return to paying to attention to that, paying much more attention to what they're doing, to what's coming to, you know, to the natural environment. And, you know, one thing I do want to mention, and and this is another show for another time, but I do think that, you know, I went to a really special class with a midwife, uh, Partera and Curandera, um, Doña Enriqueta Contrero Gonzalez, who lives in Oaxaca and she doesn't travel anymore. And I was so pleasantly surprised when I went to her class and she basically, and this was the middle of summer and we were all excited and she was going to talk about plants. And she said to us, why are you sitting here wanting to learn about plants instead of out there trying to protect them? We don't have much time. We have to protect Mm -hmm. the environment. And I was just sitting there going, oh, Oh my gosh. And this was all translated and it was just so empowering to hear this elder healer telling us to get out there as herbalists and start putting our bodies out there instead of, you know, worrying about what plant does what, you know, there might not be any plants left. Get to know the plants that are out there, (laughs) uh you know, get out there and and protect them. And, um, you know, with the way the world's moving, I think that mo- more and more herbalists are needing to be environmental activists and get out there and put their bodies on the line for these plants and these wild ones. But okay. that's another show for another time. That is. <laughs> that is. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for being with us today and interviewing with us, Nicole Douglas. Can you tell people how they can get a hold of you? Sure. Um, if people want to get a hold of me, they can go to my website, nicoletelkish.com. That's N I C O L O L E T E L K E S.com or the wildflower herb school.com. Nice. Well, that was just such a pleasure and what a, another deep conversation. <laughs> so we appreciate it. Well, as always, thank you. Thank you. Put in our <laughs> Let's do that again. Let's do as it. always. <gasps> Put Put an herb on it. The statements made about herbs and products on this podcast have not been evaluated by the United States Food and Drug Administration, FDA, and are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent disease. All information provided on this podcast or any affiliated websites is for informational purposes only and is not intended as a substitute for advice from your physician or other healthcare professional. You should not use the information on this podcast and its affiliated websites for a diagnosis or treatment of any health problem. Always consult with healthcare professional before starting any new vitamins, supplements, diet, or exercise program before taking any medication, or if you have or suspect you might have a health problem. Any testimonials, questions, or case studies are based on individual results and do not constitute a guarantee that you will achieve the same results.